What is sparking this interest in this procedure so much? Well, I think part of it is the medications we have for MS are good, but they're not cures. And so a lot of patients know this, and we tell them this, and their perception is, I would like to find something better if possible. MS can be a progressive disease. And so people see that they're losing function, and they think, you know what, what have I got to lose? I may as well just do this. Uh, and, and so they, in their mind, the risk is not the risk of the procedure, it's the risk of the disease. And if there's no benefit, hey, you know, they don't care, at least they tried something. But what we want to make sure is that the, the risk isn't so great that they end up at a worse place afterwards. Mm -hmm. So what, ha what improvement's been reported as generating all this interest? In? Well, it's the, it's, the, it's the typical things um, that, there, let me tell you, every time a new procedure comes out for MS or a new drug comes out for MS, there are kind of the three things that, that keep, uh, get really get brought out and trumpeted. So it improves fatigue, improves um, cognitive function, it may decrease the number of attacks that people are having. In clinical trials, we look at three things. Does the patient have fewer attacks? Do they have improvement on their MRI? And then the third thing is, can we slow down that progression of their disability? Those are our big three. So that's what you're looking at in this study. That that's exactly what we're going to look at. We're going to look at MRI metrics. We're going to follow, see if there are um, any change in the relapses before and after, change in the MRI before and after, and then following the patients longitudinally and seeing if there's any change in their examination longitudinally. And is that because the other things like the fatigue and circulation, is that because they could be placebo effects? Or exactly. Now we also are going to use something called a quality of life survey. And it's 36 questions and we'll ask the patient, you know, how do you feel? And it looks at mental aspects and physical aspects. But again, there, there's such a huge placebo component in anything that we do um, that it may not be very reliable. And the problem is we don't have a placebo group that we can compare in this trial to kind of tease out how much of it's placebo, how much of it's real. That's the real problem, is when you run a trial, we need placebo. We don't have placebo. And so all we're going to do is measure, are you better before you started than when you were before? Um, and I have all the data on our patients for before so that I can see how they do after. So when are we going to know if this venogram, venogram, excuse me, um, procedure really is going to make a difference? Um, most trials um, that look at these endpoints run over about two years. And so I think it's probably going to take us at least two years to really come to some conclusions. Uh, and I think some of it is going to depend on how many patients um, ultimately are willing to go through this. Um, and so my guess is probably two years we should have some idea of what direction we're heading in. It may be a bit longer. Um, it won't be sooner, that's for sure. And that's why I try to counsel patients uh, for, uh, for our patients. Um, now, that being said, there is, if there's perceived benefit that patients um, see and that as we go along, we see that there is indeed changes, then our timeline might change uh, a little bit, but that's roughly where I think we'll be. If you, before there were MRI scans, before there were ways to image the brain, when people passed away with MS, the way you tried to figure out what was going on is look at the brain. So the pathologists, when they opened the brain, they saw a lot of the inflammation in MS happens around the veins. And so um, the early neurologist said, wow, maybe this really is a problem with the veins, exactly the kind of theories that are being circulated now. And they even used blood thinners to try to treat MS. Um, and in fact, the, uh, uh, one of the kind of the founders of, of modern neurology who uh, developed the first drug to treat epilepsy uh, was a firm believer until he died that MS was actually a vascular disorder. Um, but there is no doubt that the autoimmune uh, portion of this disease is real. Um, the question is how does that start? And do the veins being narrowed make you more predisposed to that? Or does the inflammation itself somehow cause the veins to narrow? 
and then this is just epiphenomena and has nothing to do with, uh, with it. It's sort of like if somebody has foot drop from their MS and you think, I wonder if we put a brace on their foot, if that will cure their MS. Well, no. All you're doing is helping the foot drop. Well, this might be the same thing. We open that vessel, we've helped the vessel, but it's really doesn't have anything to do with uh, um, helping the MS. There are also people that don't they have narrow ves veins, but they don't have MS. Absolutely, so that's that's like twenty percent of yeah. the of yeah. the group. Yeah. Um, you can argue, maybe those are people who are at risk, mm -hmm. and that's the we'll see, or it's epiphenomena. Mm -hmm. And so, so the bottom line is, let's be excited but cautious, and take our time and not rush to judgment. I would say. Let's be cautious and let's save the excitement for a little bit later and see how it shakes out here.